my God. So The Fanatic tells the story of a mentally disabled horror fan that stalks a movie star that he's infatuated with in hopes of getting an autograph. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to start. The Fanatic. This is a film that I absolutely had to see. This is a film that stars John Travolta looking like this with that haircut playing a mentally disabled fan stalking Devin Sawa of all people written and directed by Fred Durst. This movie only had two paths to take in, in reality. This was either going to be the greatest movie of all time or the most astounding dumpster fire that I have ever seen. And let me just say this, people. Um, you're not going to hear <laughs> the Oscar goes to Fred Durst <laughs> for The Fanatic at the end of this year. That's not going to happen. So uh, it took the other route. Now, let me backpedal. This is not necessarily the most miserable movie experience I've ever had. There's, there's two different things between a bad movie experience and a terrible movie. There are movies out there that are so astoundingly bad and so shockingly horrible and every single decision that you see made in the filmmaking process is just the opposite of what they should have done that it is enjoyable and hilarious to no end to watch it burn. The Fanatic is one of those films. People talk about Troll 2. There's a documentary about how Troll 2 is the worst, best movie ever made. The Fanatic might have one of those in about 10 years. Poppycock! Poppycock! Hello, welcome to Hollywood. Welcome to Hollywood. Welcome to Hollywood. Oh, and I'll warn you now, if you're somebody that's been like highly anticipating The Fanatic, maybe don't watch this review because fuck it, I'm giving spoilers. I'm talking about this movie. I'm talking about specific plot details all the way through, baby, because there is no other way to accurately portray what the fuck I just watched. Oh my God, starting with the positives. I should have wrote notes. Is there any positives with the Fanatic? It was cool seeing Devin Sawa do something again. Although like, this is not gonna do his career any favors. Like I loved the dude back in the late 90s, early 2000s, like Idle Hands, Final Destination, that's my shit. Haven't seen the dude in forever, except for when he showed up in you know that show Nikita. He was pretty good in that, but nobody really watched it. Yeah, Devin saw while seeing him again is cool, but I mean, it, it, it was kind of like waiting for Metallica to do another album and then you get Sane Anger. <laughs> also, I mean, it, they do this thing like three times in the movie for no reason whatsoever to like, where somebody illustrates a drawing of the main character, Moose. I guess it's supposed to break up the acts of the film or something like that, but it doesn't quite work that way. So I mean, it's, it's not utilized well. That's not why it's a positive. It's just, it's unique. It's something that I haven't quite seen before. I don't know. Negatives. Negatives. Everything. Everything. Regarding the fanatic. Uh, John Travolta. My God. Quentin Tarantino, if you're watching this, which would be awesome, like, comment down below, let me know. If you are watching this, I beg of you, put John Travolta in your final film. This guy needs another get out of jail free card, and you are the only one with the power to do it after the fanatic. This is like career ending bad for John Travolta, who has been in a downslope to say the least for the past five years, seven years, 10 years. He had that little run there with like taking of Pelham one, two, three and everything like that. And, and you know, from Russia with love, which I thought was pretty good or from Paris with love. This is astounding that John Travolta signed on to do this film. I get it for like artistic reasons to a degree. Like you read the script, and you get an opportunity to play a mentally disabled character that gets unhinged in a horror slash thriller and you get to kind of explore that with a director who's not going to really tell John Travolta what he can and can't do, let's be honest. So you kind of get a free reign, a blank canvas, if you will, where you can kind of do whatever you want with this very interesting, I guess, character, at least on paper. 
but it's not executed that way. Like John Travolta, I, I don't know whether to blame Fred Durst's direction or John Travolta's acting or a evil combination of the two, but like, John, number one rule in Hollywood, baby. Everybody knows you never go full retard. I mean, he's playing an autistic character and he gives like the most stereotypical, basic, obvious ticks and nods to autism that you could possibly have. Almost like he did no research whatsoever. He was just like, all right, fuck it, I can do autistic. You went full retard, man. I mean, the lines that this guy is given, like the writing is bad enough. That's what's astounding that he took this role and that he signed on to do this movie at this stage in his career when he really should not do a movie like this. But just even the portrayal of the lines. Like the first line in the movie is John Travolta saying, I gotta take a shit. I can't talk too long, I gotta poo. He walks into a place and says, I can't talk long, gotta take a poo. That's how you're introduced to John Travolta as Moose. That's bad enough. The character's name is fucking Moose. <laughs> Moose is in the house. <laughs> Moose is in the house. Watch out. Watch out. Here's Moosey. And there's no way to absorb this performance by John Travolta other than laughter. Other than just, it, it's so over the top and ridiculous and quite frankly embarrassing to see him do something like this that you can't help but get some sick twisted enjoyment out of it. I feel I'm crying for his career in one hand and I'm laughing my ass off on the other hand. I wish Freddy Krueger would come and chop off your head and it would roll in the street and a truck would squish it and the blood would splatter everywhere and everyone would watch it. Then you get into the script and the story of this movie, which is a very basic, like, not creative story direction to go in. Like, why Fred Durst was writing this story and pushed hard enough to get a screenplay adapted into it, which he helped, to push hard enough to get a budget for him to make a movie out of, why go through all that effort for this story? We have seen different versions of this type of story a million ways from Sunday. Somebody's obsessed with a celebrity, they don't get what they want, and they go a little crazy about it. We've seen that before. There's nothing new about the way that it's portrayed in this script. It's just Fred Durst and John Travolta doing it. And the problem with it is they never really nail who you're supposed to be rooting for. Like, because of the autism and because you know in some way, shape, and form, Moose is not really understanding that he's doing anything wrong with his behavior, even though on its surface it's just unbelievably astounding behavior where you're like, get that motherfucker away from me, which is exactly what Devin Sawa's character does. You never quite know whether you're supposed to sympathize with Moose or if you're supposed to fear him. Fear. Then you get to Devin Sawa's character who is the celebrity, he's the one that he's infatuated with, who is an innocent guy. He's just going about his day, he's trying to sign autographs, he's got some personal shit going on with his wife, which it just kind of barely hints at, which is enough. But he's such a dick to John Travolta right off the rip that you don't even completely sympathize with him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dover, but I have every VHS, I have every DVD, and you're you're so rad in The Warrior. I just don't want you not to sign my stuff. You, you came to the place, but I'm officially done. But, but where do you see the special items that I have? This is Space Vampires. How would I sign your face with my fucking fists? That's a collector's item you're not going to want to take home. Trust me. Yes, sir. He's done nothing wrong. Most of us would probably do almost exactly the same thing if we saw this guy walking around our fucking house and continuously up and down our street and just showing up randomly. But you could, you could clearly tell that mentally John Travolta is not there and most people would pick up on that very quickly and I would hope would treat him a little bit differently or go about it differently. But all Devin Sawa's character does is get aggressive and get violent towards him immediately. And so you don't know who's the good guy, who's the bad guy here? Is there supposed to be a good guy? Are we just like, are we just exploring what happens when two somewhat good, somewhat bad guys are together and there's not supposed to be a direction that we're supposed to have an allegiance or you put it out there and left it open to where, you know, person A goes with John Travolta and person B goes with Devin Sawa. I don't know, but it's, 
doesn't serve your story or your movie very well when you have two characters where you're like, um, I, don't, I fuck it, I don't know, I don't know who to wrote for, I'm out. And then you get down to the filmmaking itself, and there's so many decisions where it's just like, why? Just because you've seen that done in another movie? Like, there's narration by a character that serves almost zero purpose in the movie whatsoever. It's John Travolta's only friend. She's this young girl, probably early 20s, who's a paparazzi, who, if nothing else, just takes a little bit of sympathy to John Travolta's character and is nice to him because she knows that he's mentally disabled. She's the one who narrates this story at random times. You just get random voiceover at different pieces of this movie to tell you what is blatantly obvious. Like, I'm sorry, Fred Durst, you're not that type of director or writer. We get it. We don't need anybody to explain to us what's going on between Moose and Devin Sawa. And you know what? This probably goes without saying, but there's not one tense moment in this entire film. This is supposed to be a thriller. This is supposed to get you on the edge of your seat throughout and kind of build to this crazy climax. Zero. Like, if you hook, like, some kind of a heart monitor up to any audience member, any audience member, when they watch this, you're not going to see that needle jump at all. I mean, unless laughter makes it jump, then you'll see it break off the fucking hinge. All leading up to a third act that I cannot put into words. I wasn't sure if this was going to go violent and bloody. I wasn't sure if this was going to go off the rails, weird and ridiculous. I wasn't sure if this was going to go, like, cryptic and nondescript. I had no idea where this movie was going, and it kind of went in all three. <laughs> Eventually, Moose gains access to Devin Sawa's house. He hides out a la, you know, one hour photo where he's checking out all their shit while they're not home and and chilling out on the couch when Devin Sawa's asleep next to him. You know, kiss him on his little forehead, take a selfie. But then you get to where he's pissed off enough at Devin Sawa's rejection of him that he literally ties him up to his bed and fucks with him for five or ten minutes. He acts like he's committed suicide. He's laying on the ground with fake blood. And Devin Sawa's like, holy shit. And he gets up. He's like, I <laughs> got you. Comes out later on with a Jason Voorhees mask and a fake knife and scares him into thinking he's going to stab him. And it just kind of, it's like a spring loaded knife. And he's like, <laughs> I'm a good actor. See? This actually happens, people. I'm not dramatizing this at all. Wait, wait. I fooled Heather Dunbar! I fooled Heather Dunbar! I'm, a, I'm such a good actor! God, you mind? To eventually, Devin Sawa's character coming up with the idea that I need to sympathize with this mentally disabled person and I need to make them think that I'm their friend so that they will let me loose and then I can attack. And holy fuck does he attack. And I had no idea how to take this third act, this climax, this, this these actions by Devin Sawa's character. You knock the guy down. You have a gun that can easily kill him. Like, he, he could kill you. He could kill your son if he hasn't already. You don't know. And you just torture the guy. You blow off his fingers, and then you get yourself out, and then you kick him around a bit and throw him down the stairs. and then you shoot at the side of his head to like scare him or startle him or you know like cop land and blow his eardrums out for a few minutes <laughs> and then he runs out of bullets and grabs a knife and just stabs him in an eye <laughs> just and then stands up and why where is this going you were being held captive. You were in fear for your life. And this movie, Fred Durst wants me to go along with the fact that Devin Sawa suddenly just wants to viciously torture this guy. And then suddenly has a change of heart out of nowhere and just opens the door and lets him fucking walk out of his house, missing five fingers and an eyeball. Just, all right, see you next time. Wow. But if that's not far enough, 
this is the part that will earn this movie its rating. And it's gonna be funny, because obviously I'm enjoying myself talking about this movie, but you're not getting out of this, the fanatic. Those of you, you know where this is going. After all of that, Moose is walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard. People are taking selfies with him, thinking that he's just got makeup effects, and he gives kind of like a little half painful smirk. His girlfriend with the fucking voiceovers randomly comes over and says, I'm gonna take you to the hospital. And all the while too, like earlier on, she brought it to the audience's attention that all these pictures that Moose has been taking, like selfies with Devin Sawa always asleep and everything, he's just posted to Facebook and shit, like just free on, letting everybody see that he's hanging out with Devin Sawa while he's asleep. So you got that evidence right there that he's obviously been in his house and stalking him. You have the injuries that he's going to have to go to the hospital to get attention for. You know, the eye that was stabbed and the four or five fingers that were blown off and the possible eardrum damage. And all the while, this movie and Fred Durst expects you to believe that the police are going to implicate Devin Sawa's character for the death of the maid earlier on in the film. As if Devin Sawa is not going to say, hey, all this fucking blood that I'm covered with and the ropes that are upstairs attached to my bed and the likely security camera footage that's somewhere on this million something dollar property will tell you that this psychotic motherfucker broke into my house, tied me to a bed, tortured me, I defended myself, he escaped, and he killed the maid at some point, which I just now found out because you told me I'm completely innocent. Go ahead and fingerprint me. But no, this movie expects you to think that Moose gets away with it, Devin Sawa goes to prison, and that's the climax that we get for this fucking story. Oh my god. This movie could not have been directed by anybody else but Limp Bizkit. I will just say that. Like, it, it, if I did not tell you who the director was, if I just showed you this movie, you would turn to me and say, Limp Bizkit probably directed this, didn't they? Yep, they did. Oh, in this movie, Fred Durst actually has the balls to do this inside of the film. You okay with some music? You like a little Limp Bizkit? Sure. You like a little Bizkit? Yeah. Yeah? It's loud. I used to listen to this back in the day, this is hot. This movie pauses, slams on the brakes, and tells the audience, remember how awesome Limp Biscuit was. No, I don't remember. Please enlighten me about how awesome your fucking band was that nobody talks about nowadays. My God, people, this movie. It's, I'll say this, like, Know who you are walking into it. I feel like this is a movie that I'm going to tell you how terrible it is, but I also kind of want you to experience it. It's like a weird like masochism thing. Like I want everybody to experience this movie and don't make the mistake of watching it by yourself or you know expecting a serious thing. Like get some people together, maybe throw some alcohol into the mix and just absorb the 88 minutes that you're about to absorb because holy fuck this thing exists. You rock my head and you rattle my head. You rock it, rock it, rock it like I go to bed. So all in all, guys, um, <laughs> don't watch The Fanatic ever or stop what you're doing and watch it immediately. I did. Take your pick. One of those you need to do because this has to be seen to believe. Don't let me overhype it for you. Like, it's not gonna be the most miserable movie experience ever, but it is astounding to watch the decisions unfold that were made during the making of this film. It was astounding to see John Travolta's name on it. And like I said, just seeing on paper what this was going to be, a movie about John Travolta playing a dis mentally disabled stalker directed and written by Fred Durst, I could not go living until I figured out what the hell this was going to be. So I can almost promise you will be entertained and you will have something to talk about after experiencing The Fanatic, but make no mistake, this is an unbelievable failure from start to finish in every single aspect. And especially that third act and that story conclusion that you expect me to go along with, you're not getting off scot-free, Freddy. Fuck this movie. So what did you guys think of The Fanatic? Did you actually pay to see this in theaters or did you get away for the low, low price of $5 to rent it on Amazon like I did? That's the smart route to take, I think. 
Or did you see it in a theater that was possibly filled with people that were like sick, twisted individuals like us that just wanted to experience how bad this was? That might be worth the price of admission. But let me know what your experience with the Fanatic is down below. Are you actually somebody that thought this was good? Maybe use one of those random accounts like the letter without a descript name to let me know, but uh, let me know that down below too. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. If you guys want to check out some social media links, check the video description below for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and my Patreon page, which is a great way to give back to this channel, help this channel grow, and get cool exclusive content for your eyes only if you decide to become a patron. To check all that out and right below the video description is my Spreadshirt shelf where you can find all of my merchandise, the t-shirts, the stickers, the mugs, the cinch bags, all of that cool stuff that you can throw any of my awesome designs put together by the great Woody Bowen. You can find that all just down below. So check all that out guys, and if you want to check out some more of my videos, you can check those out by clicking right over here.